The National Library of Ireland has worked in partnership with the festival since 2012, and we're delighted that this collaboration continues to grow from strength to strength. While we missed having the Dublin Book Festival audiences through our doors in 2020 and 21 because of COVID-19, we're delighted to support and host two online events this year. The partnership highlights the library as a place to be enjoyed and used by authors and readers. It also allows the library, which first opened in 1890, to be an active partner in an evolving literary festival and to host discussions about important contemporary issues. The national collections here in the library tell the story of Ireland. How we collect and how we share and interpret these collections tell a story also. The National Library of Ireland has been building the national collections for over 140 years. And over that time, Irish society has changed and evolved. The library has always been committed to equality. Our doors are open to all. And it's in this tradition that we now challenge ourselves to ensure that we reflect the change and diversity in what it means to be Irish. How we collect today will shape the story of Ireland in the future. How we engage with and present the national collections influences how people connect with their unique and living culture and heritage. We want everyone to feel welcome, visible and represented in the National Library of Ireland. So I'm really delighted that we can host this event, event entitled Diverse Republic and to welcome Brian Fanning and Miluta Ucha Okori for this discussion. I'll hand over now to Brian. Brian Fanning is Professor of Migration and Social Policy at University College Dublin. He has published extensively on immigration and social change in Ireland. His previous books include Migration and the Making of Ireland and Histories of the Irish Future. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you so much for hosting this event. Uh, I mean, the, you know, the, the, this is fantastic for our cultural life. And it's great to see us being able to do this, notwithstanding COVID. And I am absolutely delighted to be here with Malatu today as I am a huge admirer of her work. Well, thank uh, you. I think it's not just worthy, it's actually brilliant. Uh, and I hope we get to talk about some aspects of that uh, as we proceed. I'd also like to give a shout out to Irish publishers, the small Irish publishers, heroic publishers like Skane Press and UCD Press, who produce these, let's just say, boutique books for a boutique audience, uh, and then find that in the Irish bookshops, also great friends for Irish writing, whether it's about the factual changes that are taking place in our society, kind of my stuff, which is kind of academic in its style, but also designed for general readership, or Malato's brilliant short stories, uh, which are published by Skane Press in uh, her landmark collection, This Hostile Life, uh, which is, you know, it is perhaps a must read within 21st century Irish writing. I mean, I don't have a, a, a monopoly on what's good or bad about 21st century Irish writing, but I would say for this, it is, we're in an era of great women writers and that's very, very important. Um, interestingly, within writing about modern Ireland and life in 21st century Ireland, the kind of essay has come to the fore and a lot of people are talking about their, their lives and their lived experiences, often as women, in a series of, of fabulous books. But then we go back to the short story, which is one of the great forms of literature in Ireland, and we find truths and things about human nature and human life, uh, and also a documentation of realities of life in this country handled so much better than they could ever be in the dead prose of academics and the dead prose of official reports, uh, you know, which report facts, but somehow fail to capture uh, the human spirit at work. Uh, 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 and the incredible humanity of everybody who struggles through some very difficult systems. Uh, so Milatu's uh, collection called This Hostile Life, you know, has a, a, the title story in this collection, you know, has already gained huge recognition. It has been turned into an operatic work. It is, you know, I could see it as a movie someday, you know, but it certainly demands to be read. Uh, and 
it is it is literally just a story of people going about the business of of living their lives in a day to day humdrum routine in a direct provision hostel where their experiences and their interrelationships and their humanity is all in display, as are their incredible frustrations, um, with a system that basically live, kind of constrains them, is deliberately designed to constrain them, perhaps. And the one line I take from that story, perhaps, is a general thing with philosophy that basically, if you were maps onto every interview I've ever read with an asylum seeker or a refugee, is the line in the story attributed to the narrator, nothing is better than when you decide something for yourself. You know, having your life handed to you, being made to you, being fed when you're supposed to be fed, and, and treated in this kind of coercive way, even if it's very, very well-meaning, although often it isn't, uh, you know, it, it just makes it so difficult for people to live their lives. And I'd like to, to pass you over, perhaps from Malata, to say hopefully a few words about that story and why, uh, why basically one of the characters fight for a jar of honey queuing is, 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 is so important to that character and to the story. Oh, wow. Um, Okay, um, Brian, I, uh, thank you so much for those beautiful words. Uh, I actually thought we came to talk about diverse republics. So I was all ready to ask you, do you that too. questions. You that too. <laughs> there you well, are. Yeah, um, well, I, I think with, uh, with the, so, sometimes with that story, I feel, you know, looking at things the way things are right now, in the, you know, in the circumstances that we're living now, I feel that, that I feel almost vindicated with that story. You know, um, that um, there's just so much going on that you you kind of, you see it, this is whether people want to acknowledge it or not, you see it in everyday life. And um, that woman fighting for her jar of honey is just, you know, it, it's just, I think it's a story of every migrant not wanting to give up, despite the, you know, the, the, the challenges or the barriers that you face. The jar of honey could be anything, you know, it could be, you know, sometimes you're overlooked because of your education, because of the way you look, because of, you know, you know, so many things that, you know, can happen because it's not like there was no jar of honey, it's just that the person given it decided that you, you know, because sometimes we have a society that is at the discretion of the person, you know, you always hear that language, you know, this can only be done at the discretion of the person in charge. So that was what happened in that scene. It was at the discretion of the person in charge to decide I'm not going to give her honey, but I'm going to give the guy that comes behind her honey. And then she decides, no, it, it can't be like that. It should be equal for everyone. It should be, you know, it shouldn't be at your discretion to decide what, you know, to give to me or what I'm entitled to in a sense. But if you're going to give it at all, you give it to everyone or you don't give it to anyone at all. So I think that's just the story, the, 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 the premise of that story. So it was important um, for her as, as you know, I, I think for, I think that's the story of every migrant to fight, you know, in a sense, you know, because you, you try to fit in, you try to keep going, you know, not just for yourself, because you can, when you come to a new country, you come with so many hopes and aspirations and dreams and all of that. And you don't want to let it go at every crossroad. So you tend to want to, you know, to dig in and uh, and fight for the respect that you know every human being deserves. I think. Yeah. I mean, I I I just love that story, but it also haunts me because, you know, for the last twenty years or so since direct provision was introduced, I have you know done bits of research on it. I actually inter we interviewed people in a study that was published in two thousand that pretty much says everything. That you'd read about or understand about it now, all the things that are wrong with it, especially around family life and people trying to live with dignity within a system uh, that basically stops them getting on with them just living their lives in an ordinary way. I mean, everybody loves to stay in a hotel for a night, but nobody wants to be crammed into a hotel room with their family for months or years, you know, waiting to be fed at a certain time, not being able to give their child their favorite food. You know, um, I, I see the little frustrations that, uh, that basically tip people over into incredible stress, frustration. And, uh, you know, watching the media today, there's a hunger strike taking place at the moment amongst asylum seekers. Uh, when the first refugees came to Ireland under the UN program in 1957, the Hungarians who were put in a former army barracks outside Limerick, uh, they all, all the adults in that camp eventually went on hunger strike. You know, just literally out of the frustrations about having their lives micromanaged and not doing, as you've just said, being allowed to get on with their, building their lives in that normal human way. I mean, I, I'm guessing that you know most humans want roughly the same things. They want the best for themselves, their families, their friends, and their children. 
If they make a migrant journey, they do so to hopefully have a better life, not to have a worse one. It's a brave journey for many to make. They make that journey with the best of information that they have at their disposal. They try and do something wise for their family. They're not fools, they're not stupid, they're not simpletons. They're actually brave and thoughtful people. And then they come and they want to contribute and, and basically add to. And, and that, that those, in essence, are, are that's my understanding from of migrants, from somebody who lives in other countries, but also from interviewing and talking and looking at the lives from outside of so many migrants from so many backgrounds over the years. And then they end up making a contribution, including this incredible cultural contribution that we're seeing now, not just Malata's own work, but music, uh, art, fashion, you know, at every strand, we're basically beginning to see kind of, uh, kind of immigrant cultures and African Irish culture kind of manifesting itself and, and just making this place richer and more beautiful than it was. And, uh, you know, I mean, the terrible thing about it is, is that, you know, there had to be suffering in the world to write those great stories. But those great stories, like great short stories written by many other writers, are, are a testament to human experience, to universality within humans in terms of feelings of frustration. And I guess basically what I would hope people would take from those stories is the capacity to have empathy with others, to have empathy with people whose lives have just been lived a little bit differently than their own. They haven't had maybe the same opportunities, but are just as human. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really kind of, uh, I'm always kind of, yeah, I keep coming back to that story, this hostile life. There are many other good stories as well. And I do hope we see a further collection of your work soon. Is that likely, Malatu? What was the question again? <laughs> Is there going to be another book soon? Collecting <laughs> all the stories that are out there. Yes, there are, there are all the stories. Um, you know, uh, well, this whole the life seems to, it's, it's, it's a story about, um, you know, as you know, life in, in direct provision. So it's it's different in itself. And I think that's the only story that I have that is, is at the moment that is published, that is set in, that is actually set you know, in fact, and um, just to follow up on some of the things you said, you see, that, that's, there's a narrative that I've always found missing in every conversation that I hear about asylum seekers. You mentioned that, you know, um, direct provision has been in existence for 20 plus years, you know, and I just keep hearing that language, asylum seekers, but no one ever does actually do a follow up as in, where are those people from 20 years on, you know, we have all these um, programs growing up in Ireland and all of that, but I've never seen anything drawn, you know, afterwards like okay where are the people that were in direct provision after you know this number of years because what when, when they are they are the nurses that you find in the hospitals they're the carers in people's homes they're the bankers they're the i'm sitting here with you today having a conversation you know as a writer so there are so they're doing so many things but no one ever follows up on that narrative as in where are they you know they just keep leaving it at the point of asylum because asylum because as well. but they are the ones contributing they're the doctors some of them are the doctors like some of them are lawyers you know so we need to have that full narrative in every in every sense because it's, it's like you say asylum seekers and, and mig or immigrants but then the asylum seekers go on to become the immigrants that you're talking about that are contributing but it, that narrative has never been followed through and it needs to be that truth needs to be told you know yeah. so i couldn't agree with you more i mean i i teach in university college dublin and in my class, you know, in my first year, second year, well, I don't have a second year class, I've got first year and third year, there are people who grew up in direct provision in, in, you know, of African origin, uh, who are, you know, and some who actually are still in the asylum system, who are basically studying in our school, and they will do degrees and they will contribute to life in this society, hopefully brilliantly, you know, and, and uh, yeah, they are the future of this country as much as anybody else's children are the future of this country. Uh, as a social scientist, particularly interested in this, I mean, I try and track those changes. Uh, some of those stories are, well, you know, there's a broader story basically of Ireland being quite a positive place you know, where we don't have anti-immigration politics like some other countries. But then there's this other aspect to it that we somehow have systems and organizations and institutions that still manage to marginalize people who are, you know, who should be treated as full members of our society, whether it's, whether it's you know, jobs in any institution whether it's the professions and so on. And, and as you say, we have all these people who are invisibly going about their business, living their lives, making these huge contributions uh, to, 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 to our society. Uh, and, and, and they don't get to be heard. And again, this comes back to why writing is so important, as well as the other arts. Is this kind of, if you know, in the last couple of years, really, maybe the last two years, I'd see in the Irish Times and elsewhere, you know, a bit of a focus on, on diversity, a bit of a focus on the artistic and, 
and intellectual and cultural contributions of people you know, who have settled here and become Irish citizens. And that's relatively new, and we need to hear an awful lot more of it. We need to see it in our me media, we need to hear it on our radios. Uh, and we do need, as you say, to recognize the contributions people are making. And that's why the other stories you write are, are also part of this, because they, they're basically stories of people living their lives as everybody else does, experiencing similar kinds of predicaments, whether it's basically fear of domestic violence or, or something much more positive or happy in their lives. And these stories are just as much part, these are as much Irish short stories as the stories of Frank O'Connor were once Irish short stories. They're, they're telling us about our country, our place, our time, and they will be read by others after the fact to get insights on what it was like to live, you know, in our era. Uh, so yeah, art can make an enormous contribution, I think, to shifting, shifting that, 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 that dial, perhaps, to bringing awareness to those, those contributions. Uh, and just that feel about who we are. Uh, I was motivated to call this book Diverse Republic because I wanted to write a short book which basically talked about, not, not very prescriptively, I don't have a clear idea of where we're going. My view is that it's for all of us to decide where we're going to go. It's for you know, everybody to decide what Ireland's future is. But, at the, but, but what we see is a country that has changed tremendously over the last century and has got incredibly huge potential to do a good job with, with addressing the, the relatively recent diversity as a result of immigration. Uh, you know, we, we should have set citizenship policies that are inclusive. We should have social policies that are inclusive. Uh, nationalism is a big deal in Ireland, perhaps, as it is in most uh, ethnic, uh, formerly mono-ethnic nation states. But with leaders like Michael D. Higgins, you know, we have a possibility for talking inclusively about what it is to be Irish. And we need to see more of those voices at the table and to take, you know, a, a, a wide, deep, inclusive version of who we are as a diverse society and and see that then reflected in our institutions as a diverse republic i mean that would be my idea now how we flesh out that aspiration is work being done by ever so many people in ever so many places all at the same time and how it will turn out is is, is up to everybody it's not for any one person to lay it down uh, but artistically you know we have a poet in, in we have a poet you know, as president you know we have art we, artists can contribute uh, and 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 they 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 just I think they give us stuff that that just we just don't get in other ways of of, of storytelling or truth telling, you know official reports which I have written some uh, nonfiction books ostensibly nonfiction books that are about things you know sociology or facts or demography or you know where different ethnic groups are found within the labour market or all of these things are important but they they don't quite bring it to life in the way that sort of culture does, you know, uh, and creativity does. Uh, so we need it all, in my view. Uh, we certainly do. I strongly agree, Brian. I, I do, you know, I've been, you know, one of the, one of the things that I'm so uh, passionate about is just to have more voices, more diverse voices come up in things and tell, you know, stories from their perspectives, because it adds richness to things and then you're aware oh is this happening can i just tell you something i was reading diverse republic there was something that you you, you mentioned that happened in 2019 in Barbregan, you know yeah. about you know, <laughs> I, I i live in Barbregan. i didn't even know that happened until i read it in your book so that's how important books are i'm like oh what's that what was going on at the time because you know you could sense things in the air but, you know, I wasn't sure what was going on, but, you know, just reading that. Gemma and John Waters. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so those characters who were standing for, you know, on a far right ticket, deliberately had a meeting in Balbriggan where they were trying to create this sort of narrative that I think the local community in all its diversity rejected. Uh, that somehow immigration and immigrants and diversity was a threat. Uh, and, you know, they did have their acolytes and their supporters. And indeed, there are people who are very discombobulated about change. Uh, but most of them don't blame immigrants for, in this country, at least for the problems we experience. So, which, which banking, the housing crisis, these things are not the, the fault of immigrants. They are, they are challenges to be met. They are complicated challenges to be met. But in Balbriggan, yes, uh, you had a few attempts uh, by far-right figures to politicize immigration. And they deliberately went to an area associated with I know. a first century diverse Ireland to complain, but they weren't speaking for that community. They weren't speaking to that community. 
uh, they were speaking, you know, to Twitter. They were speaking to Facebook. Uh, and, you know, I wasn't at that meeting, but I was able to do a transcript of that particular meeting by sitting up late at night, kind of writing it all, typing it all down before it was taken down. Uh, you know, but nevertheless, you know, these things are happening in our midst as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, oh, I have uh, no idea. It was so interesting when I read it. I was like, oh, my God. You know, yeah, uh, my, yeah. my mind went back to the period you, you, you referred to. Uh, you know, that was, that was an interesting one for me. Yeah. Really. Yeah, I, I decided in this book to do something that I haven't done before in books, which was to take the, the people who are anti-immigrant seriously, because in the United States, we could sort of see with Trump and America first, or indeed even with Brexit, a sort of, you know, leaving the European is often about the immigration issue for so many people, or the fact that the far right populist parties have done so well in so many democratic countries. And yet in Ireland, we didn't seem to have you know, any of these voices elected. But at the same time, they're nevertheless there, churning away, trying to get support, doing their protests and so on. And, 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 and essentially trying to politicize immigration in a way that it hasn't been politicized in Ireland. And what I wanted to really do as an academic was to try and understand, you know, their concerns, their anxieties, their claims, truth or otherwise. And then basically asking, well, why is that stuff not gelling with the Irish people more generally? You know, why aren't we blaming migrants for things in the extent to which happens in other countries? Uh, and there are quite complicated and subtle things about the Irish story, Irish nationalism and so on, that perhaps, and also about the emergence of progressive politics in Ireland. But that's one side of the coin. The far right are fairly marginal figures. I, 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 I would be fearful that into the future, a charismatic figure or somebody who speaks a language that works better with more people might get some toehold in Irish politics. But most Irish politicians seem to kind of sidestep that issue of racism. They're not, they're, they really are not trying to play an anti-immigration card. The problem instead is that we have a political system and a debate that also invisibilizes immigrants. In other words, there are, notwithstanding the fact that our, we don't have racist political parties doing well in the doll, we still have people who are very marginalized. We still have the direct provision system. You know, we still have people facing discrimination. You know, African Irish people face discrimination in the labour market. That is quite clear. The evidence is just incontrovertible in with that. Uh, so there are problems and issues that desperately need to be addressed uh, as well. But in a sense, what we have is this kind of strange atmosphere where, where maybe the far right aren't getting any sort of toehold. And at the same time, whilst politicians can say kind words at times, they're not really seeing kind of some reforms and changes taking place that would make our country more inclusive. There are things that could perhaps easily be done that would improve the quality of life for so many communities. Uh, and that kind of work does need to be done as well. So, yeah, my book is really about trying to look at the angles and aspects of that and probably think more generally about the kind of work we do uh, that could be basically improved upon uh, to basically make our country live up to its diversity and its promise, its great promise. I think, you know, going down that route um, of, in whatever, you know, sense is a cheap shot, you know, if a politician goes down that route, because as you said, there's nothing to, there's no, it's not the immigrant's fault in terms of, you know, whatever the case may be, being banking, the, you know, um, housing, you know, we can go into the housing issue a bit more, but, you know, so, but, you know, um, uh, it, 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 it made me sad in a sense when people um, pit people against each other, in a sense, just to get ahead, because that's just exactly what it is. Um, uh, and it just uh, there's a there's a proverb in my place that says that uh, you know um, it, 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 it says a, a man's mind is like is like a, a kettle, you know. So when you put it on the on the stove and turn it on, it just boils over. Mm. And that's what, in certain in, in certain cases, that's just what it is. In some cases, where you find certain politicians or certain people manipulating the minds of people in that sense, as in you know, boil it over and say, "Oh, it's someone in your community that's causing you know that's you know probably causing the short ration of certain things." When we know, in 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 essence, that that's not the case. Yeah. I I I found that I found within that part the part of. Um, Gemma and John and all the rest of them. I found it very disturbing. You know, I found it very, very disturbing. I found some of their comments, her tweets. You know, um, I, I don't want to give her any. I don't want to give her any more light. I don't want to worry about her. You know, but I, I did find that very. You know, that a human being could do that about other human beings. You know, that was that was quite disturbing. But 
I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, you know, give her any more, you know, a mention apart from this. But um, yeah, that was that wasn't very nice. And um, I, 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 I suppose, in a sense, I understand why you felt that they needed to be uh, brought to light in a sense of spoken about um, because of what's going on in other countries. But um, but I, I think that the the the, the it's, it's not about the not being, it's not that they're being shut down, but I think that just like what I said to you a few minutes ago, when you think about when we keep throwing out some words like asylum seekers, it's, it's good for us to go to the end, you know, like take it and then go to the end of it. If you're talking about asylum seekers, where, what are the asylum seekers doing? Where are they right now? What are they? It's 20 years on. So let's kind of like, let's know where they are. Are they, what are, what are the jobs that they're doing in society? Because when we're portraying those, those angles, then people like that wouldn't have anything to hang on. But if we keep, you know, going that they, are, 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 you know, the asylum seekers are here, the this, this, this are here, they're, you know, they're, they're being kept. Because I remember, you know, a few years ago when it was all, they're being kept in a hotel, being, and then hopeless, homelessness struck everywhere and people were being kept in hotels. And then they got to know what it felt like to be in a hotel day in, day out, like you mentioned, with your children and not being able to do so many things. And then they realize that, oh, it wasn't that, you know, they are not actually in a holiday home having the best time of their lives as, as the narrative was at the time. So you see all of these things, I think that sometimes we just, you know, we take a piece, someone says something, it sounds nice, you know, and people run with it and they don't actually research deeply to know how true these things are, you know, and how, practical on what that means in a sense. Uh, talking about artists and, you know, and having more voices come up and, and doing this so much, I've, I've spoken so many times about having more, more voices and even, you know, at a time I was accused of being, um, um, of, of not being inclusive because I was campaigning that we should have like, uh, you know, like centers and all of that for where uh, migrants and, you know, um, you know, just like you have, you know, uh, migrants and black and ethnic minorities can just be as artists that they would should have a platform where they would know that this is where I can go to and know what's happening within the society, know where, you know, know who is, what's going on, if there's any kind of, um, if there are jobs going on, if they're as an artist, if they're trainings, if they're these, because as we have now, not everyone is utilizing the art centers and uh, you know they've been there. There's so many art centers around, but not every migrant knows to go in there to 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 find out what's going on. So uh, and within the education system in schools, when you find out that some certain children need English support or that they they you know that they need language support, you take them out of the room and you create something especially for them so that they can catch up with other people, you know. Uh, or in every other setting, there's a, you, you, you kind of make a separate classroom and then you, you try to bring them up so that they can catch up. And that's the same thing with arts. You know, there's just not, if there's no, none of that kind of, okay, let's create something as well so that they can, you know, catch up. They would know what's going on so that they can now go into the main society and be able to utilize the facilities that are in there. That's not the case for arts here. And that's just the, 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 the plea that I've been making. It's not like I'm not being inclusive or, you know, because you get accused of all of these things, but there's a lack there. And people need to know there has to be something to bring them from point A to point B. So, and if we don't make, if we don't make that facility available, it's not, it's not gonna work. There has to be something for certain people, by certain people, you know, as, as, as disability, as I said, nothing for us, that is not by us, you know, that is not, you, you have to include them in all of these decisions and even in managing it in a sense so that they will be able to participate fully in that. And I think that that's just what is hap happening within the arts. And that's the case that I'm making because all of these centers, they, they, they should be centers around somewhere like Babrega needs an art center, definitely. And it's going to be run by the locals and all of that. And, you know, I, I, don't, I digress, Brian. No, oh, it's not a digression at all. Um... Uh, I, 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 you were, while you were speaking there, I was thinking to my time living in London. So in my 20s, I'm 85 to 95, I was in London. And I worked for local authorities. And I remember the Irish Centre in Camden. You know, it was an artistic centre, a cultural centre. Uh, it was a social centre as well. But because of the work I was doing, I was also often in the, the Afro-Caribbean Centre, as it was called, that Bernie Grant had founded, who was a local uh, kind of uh, black MP. 
Uh, and and, and there, were, there were Cypriot centers as well. And all of these were, if you will, places in the same community. Uh, they were actually quite inclusive spaces in lots of respects, but they, they just gave people, I don't know, a kind of a, a center for certain aspects of their life. Uh, so, you know, but they were cultural resources as well. I think that was very, very important. Uh, and, and, and these things basically also were places to which people trained up as leaders. Uh, they learned how to provide services for, for their own communities and for others. Uh, and, you know, there are other structures that do these kinds of things, like churches, uh, kind of mosques uh, for people who are in faith communities. Not everybody is, however. Uh, so we, we sort of do, we, what I, mean, I would argue as a sociologist is, looking at how migrants kind of have operated around the world over the last few centuries, including the Irish who went abroad. When the Irish went to Liverpool or New York or anywhere else in the 19th century, you quickly saw a Catholic church staffed by Irish priests with an Irish school next to it and a, and a, and a parish hall within which all sorts of community stuff was taking place. And, 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 and that was a springboard, not just for people to have a decent life or to have some sort of kind of center for themselves, but it was also the springboard from which they launched themselves into the wider society, into the I, you, I mean, all communities and all cultures. You, know, you said it all. False narrative that people can only kind of integrate if they kind of join the mainstream thing. Whereas you, you the reality of it is that people come with families, communities, friends, and it's that support at a local level uh, and that support in their community that support in their church, that support maybe through the arts, that then gives people that opportunity then to basically realize their human potential uh, and contribute and be fully part of society more generally. So yeah, we do need to give people support in their communities and we need to let those people, wherever they are, def define their own communities for themselves. It shouldn't be top down. We should be encouraging it to manifest itself. Absolutely. And that's just what I've been saying. And I love that you mentioned the Irish centers in so many countries, you know, yeah. and none of those countries ever complain that why, you know, why an Irish center, you're not being inclusive. Why isn't it, you know, why is an Irish center in Brazil, in Spain, in here, in here? Because, you know, like, and that's a promotion of culture and it's benefiting everyone. So yeah. I, I don't understand why people don't see it that way, you know, over here. It's just, it's just, it's, it's because if you don't have that little um you know that little uh little community of arts or whatever within like you, you just beautifully explained yeah. it yeah, that, that's the only place where they can springboard to do bigger things to 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 reach out to expand to you know to come into the widest because there's nowhere to go but to fit into the wider society anyway so it's just a place of nurturing you know uh, when i lived in london the biggest social the biggest event of the year in the city was the notting hill carnival Mm. And that grew out of the the, the kind of uh, kind of what you know the Windrush generation of uh, Caribbean Black Caribbean migrants who came and settled in London around the Notting Hill area, and then that became manifested Britain in terms of culture, reggae music, uh, ska music, so many other things, and, and and these things now are understood to be central to British popular music and culture. Uh, so you know we enrich our culture by basically giving people a chance to. To basically display it to us and 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 to nurture it themselves you know it's, whether it's music or art or drama or, or or whatever you know so i think the arts are very important for a rich society in that sense uh, and we're very lucky in ireland that i think we do value the arts in ireland uh, and here we are basically you know in the 21st century with this opportunity to do to basically just further enrich and deepen our own artistic cultures in this society. And everybody's a winner from that, I think, you know? Everybody's a winner uh, when you see that a, 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 a sort of at work in a community, you know? And also people can make good livings out of it as well. I mean, people people like like culture, they like food, they, we consume these things, and they, they nurture our spirits, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for, for explaining that so well, because like you say, it's just, uh, it's just been in there, it's frustrating because, you know, you get all these accusations of the, you know, you're not being inclusive when you mention these things. And it's like, it's, that's not the point. The point is not about being, you know, it's not being inclusive or exclusive or anything like that. It's just like, we need to diversify culture in a sense. Like everyone has to, you can't micromanage how someone else is going to bring their culture out. You know, you have to allow them to, you know, no, to give a space to 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 
to grow and nurture themselves, you know, and then, you know, they can now flower out. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm very interested in history as an academic discipline, okay? And up to a, maybe very recently, a couple of decades ago, if you read the mainstream histories of the Irish state and Irish society, women were invisible within those stories, whether it was in the War of Independence or any other place. You know, it was basically the story of men, civil servants, leaders, you know, government archives telling a certain narrative. And, you know, now, now these days we would expect a decent historian to be able to talk about family, culture, place, community, um, to be more sociological perhaps about what they're describing, but also to include the kinds of voices that were shut out of the official story of our nation. So when you talk about the journey people have made, say, maybe from direct to vision, you know, into basically realizing their lives in Ireland with difficulty and suffering often, but nevertheless doing what humans do best, which is just getting on with it and looking after themselves, their families and contributing to society, to culture, to life. You know, that story has yet to be written. Now, uh, as a sort of an academic, I've kind of sketched out aspects of it. But the thing of it is, is I'm a white academic who is interested in things like migration history and how Ireland changes as a society. But my, but I, I can't be, I can't substitute for the kinds of voices like you or all those voices to come who will begin not just writing poetry or making music, but also become academics, become historians, uh, who tell the stories of your generation of people here in the same way that if you were in the United Kingdom, you would read about the stories of the Windrush generation. Yes. I would love to see, would love to see RTE uh, and other broadcasters uh, and writers begin to look at the history of immigration. We're already basically a few decades into this. You know, there is a history of Moore Street. There is a history of Parnell Street. There is a history of Balbriggan. There's a history of Dublin 15. There's a history of Mulhudder. There is a history of all these places to be told. And these are at least as real and real to us in our storytelling as say local studies or county histories of the past, which tell us about place names and people and customs and holy wells and traditional music and farming and all those things that were that were helped get us to where we are now. So we, we sort of need to basically add to the richness of the story we tell ourselves about ourselves, not just in art, but also through the scholarship, uh, you know, bringing stories out. And, and to do that, we need people getting their thoughts down on paper. Like I did a book a few years ago on the history of migration to and from Ireland. When mm. I wrote about the Jewish community, you know, yeah. the chapter of the Jewish community. You mentioned community, them here as well. I was able to basically read biographies written by people, autobiographies written by people who, who describe their lives before they came to Ireland, during and the rest of it. And so these voices could kind of shine through. And they're so much richer than the sort of truncated things you get sometimes in newspapers or the stylized stories about the asylum seeker as a figure. Uh, and I think we just need to see this flourishing of writing uh, everywhere, you know, not just of, of African Irish people, but also people from other backgrounds. And, and, and then this will basically kind of should, should add to the story of the Irish nation, of the Irish peoples, you know, into the future. So think of a historian writing in 2070 about our era. What will they say about us? Where will they go to find out what was happening? You know, will they go to YouTube and find our conversation or will they listen to you give a reading? You know, will they basically read a biography written by maybe you in your old age or, 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 or somebody else? You know, will they basically look at a cultural piece of work done by young children? Will they basically look at the, uh, an artistic band perhaps formed by, by, by youth in Limerick? You know, all of these things are, are, are going to be part of our story. Will they look at the struggles of people to be included who face discrimination and then basically pass make judgment perhaps on what we've been doing uh, to, 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 to basically you know, to be inclusive or not in our society at the moment, the way we now look rather critically about some aspects of past Irish history. Will, the, will, will direct provision be taught in this, in, in, by historians in the same way the Magdalene laundries are being taught about now? You know, as, as this strange coercive system that somehow manifested itself within us that, that basically had to be ultimately disavowed. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, the, the, we're, we're living in part of a story. We're living at a time when you know, there are, there's much that's positive in our society, as well as many challenges. There are many opportunities as well as difficulties. And there are ever so many stories that just need to be told and to tell themselves. Absolutely. Uh, and they, and all cumulatively will add to something. 
they will basically be they, they will be basically the an inheritance we can give to the next generations you know our stories um, and, and they would they would they would basically interpret the past basically you know in their own good way uh, but I, I actually think that I'm, as an academic, I'm kind of, I write a fair bit about immigration, uh, mostly because I kind of see myself laying down a part of a foundation of a literature. And I just like to see the idea of the literature being built. More writing, more studies if you're a scholar, more novels if you're a novelist, more, more, you know, more, more short stories. Um, Talking about literature, Brian. Would that be, you, you, there's, a, there's a line in your book, hundred, uh, I think it's um, page 117, where you said the key to designing integration policies, I want to get this question in before we go, mm. the key to designing integration policies is to identify issues and barriers that apply to multiple groups and deal with these as such. What would be your, you know, it's, uh, the, the, I love that part, the, the diverse republic, the whole integration policies and all of that, you know, and you said sometimes barriers affect people from the same culture or religious backgrounds living in different areas, but it affects them differently. That's just what you're trying to say. So I just wanted to know a little bit more about that, about, you know. I'm a social scientist and we work with data, not poetry. Uh, we work with data. And let's just say for argument's sake, you have a certain group who's experiencing marginalization because they have lesser rights. Yes. Yeah. So we know the asylum process, for example, makes it very difficult. It, it creates this gap in people's lives. They put their lives on hold because they can't do things. Let's just say we know that racism causes barriers for certain people because of the color of their skin. You know, we know that racism affects certain groups. Uh, let's just say we know that there are gender inequalities uh, and so on and so forth. Let's just say we know that basically if you can't speak English in a society where pretty much everybody speaks English, you can't even realize your rights and entitlements let alone have the same opportunities as another person. So, but we can basically look at all the data that's available uh, and we can basically, we can basically create a sort of a fair picture of what the barriers that people are likely to experience. Now, it's not that, it, different groups have different cocktails of problems or issues. If you're, if you're say a Francophone asylum seeker who can't speak English, you have problems that say, for example, somebody who's a graduate of English from another country doesn't have even though they're in the same system. There are, the social science is quite complicated, but from the point of view of the, the mainstream society, the challenge includes identifying problems that if you alleviate them for different for groups that are marginalized, benefit everybody. So in other words, basically, there are, if we could basically get the system working, you know, whether it's our employment system or our education system, so that say certain groups aren't left behind. Yes. Chances are the skills and abilities we bring to bear to make that happen benefit everybody as well yeah so that's part of it so you know some of uh, there are a few hints to the power of disaggregating data in my book but mostly uh, there are ideas about basically you know integration i mean i know we kind of talked about basically the need for cultural centers for people of you know different communities and so on but there's also an argument that migrant and it comes across in your story this hostile life the, the women in that story come from many different countries they're very different from one another. This is quite good. They barely know each other, even though they are friends. They're thrown together. Uh, they've some are Egyptian, some are Francophone, some places, some from different religions. They're very different from one another. So the point is to identify the kinds of things we can do that basically work for everybody. Uh, so you can't be designing. The argument would be there in part of the book is no point designing an integration policy for a particular ethnic group. You should be designing an integration policy that works for many groups that addresses many of the similar problems faced by similar groups, whether it's in relation to education or something. There's a concept called hyperdiversity that basically looks at cities like London, where immigrants don't come from one country. So there's no point talking necessarily about the uh, French community. Yeah. It's 70 countries. So that kind of creates a lot of challenge, but also a lot of opportunity. So the trick, you know, for, for, for us, businesses are good at this sometimes. Coming up with a service that works well for many different groups, coming up with basically a way of accessing something that is genuinely accessible for people from different backgrounds, putting a bit of thought into how you design this, kind of working on the premise that, you know, there isn't that sort of cultural homogeneity and you can't just deal with immigration by speaking to the, the elders of a couple of communities, thinking you've got it all boxed away, but that really somehow you need to engage with a, a very, very diverse population. And one of the things about Ireland is, is that if we talk about Africans, but Africa is a genomic place compared to Ireland, which is a tiny place. We talk about Nigeria, but Nigeria has many different religions and ethnic groups. 
are people who are actually quite different from one another in many respects. So to homogenize these doesn't make an awful lot of sense. At the same time, it is rather confusing and difficult for maybe some people to carry all these ideas and all these cultures in their heads, unless that's something they're really interested in. So mm. we need to basically figure out, we need to figure out that we're just dealing with diversity all the time. So we have ways of dealing with patients in the hospital. It's got to be about respect and respecting people's cultures and religions, whatever they are, you know, and to coming up with operating ways of working and training people to just to how to manage their dealings with others respectfully in such a way that the system works for everybody. And, and these challenges are not beyond human beings. And a society that is good at handling diversity and complexity is a society that is very well geared up to do well, you know, in, in terms of business and in terms of so many other things. Because, you know, we, we, we are particular. We have a particular culture for ourselves. We have particular values, maybe religious, culture, family. But we are also part of, of a wider society that's also very diverse. You know, we need to be getting used to the idea that, you know, we're living in a diverse society. Our institutions, our civil servants, our schools, our hospitals and so on are often very good at this. Uh, civil servants, yet less so, perhaps, as yet. But, we, but the better we get, basically, at handling that kind of diversity that is also within our, our republic, you know, the better we're going to be at ever so many other things as well. And if we're kind of good at developing services and systems that can pick up on people left behind, you know, for one reason, we can, there's so much that we can then roll out to how we respond to, to perhaps everybody, you know. It's about really learning how to do things. Uh, okay, that's a bit scrunched and a bit over the top, perhaps, give you so much in, in just a, a minute or two. But there is, there's so much to be gained in learning to understand how to deal with the kinds of complexity that we've thrown up by immigration in a mutually beneficial way. If our systems get good at this and better at this, like I see when I go to hospital to get my, my blood work done or whatever, I go in and I see a little screen and I can do, I can do whatever language I like. I do mine in English, obviously, but somebody could do it in Polish or Mandarin or something else. So just by having that portal, it is equally accessible to everybody. You know, so there are ever so many things you can do. But then when you flip that in its head, there's a business case for doing that as well. You know, a country that is very good with you know dealing with basically a bit of diversity and a bit of complexity is a country that's very agile uh, in, in terms of being able to, to deal with the world, uh, whether it's through business or anything else. So having an arts and cultural sector that basically is enriched by kind of migrant communities, immigrant voices, uh, call them the new Irish, call them what you will, uh, but that is going to be something that's ever so much more attractive to the world into the 21st century. It's going to be, of, you know, its ability to engage with others beyond Ireland will also be so rich. Uh, that would be my hope anyway, yeah. Thank you, Brian. I have, there's another thing that struck me. I know this is a very controversial topic now, but, you know, I just have to raise it. it in, the, in the book, you mentioned that um, some um, councillors, or was it, to, what they were called, did not utilise the money given to them to build some halting sites for, you know, for, I think it was 10 councillors in or 10 communities. If this is travellers you're talking about. Yes, 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 yes. Wait, so wait, what, what wait. happened, if, if we're talking about diverse, you know, republic, you know, what, what, what kind of accountability, you know, uh, is needed here? Uh, okay, this is the traveller issue. And one of the reasons I mentioned travellers in the book is that travellers are an ethnic minority in Ireland who have been, you know, marginalised across the decades, discriminated against, uh, and they have experienced a form of racism. Uh, and, and basically, it's, it's, you know, we need to understand those experiences of travellers as basically the kind of failures, the kinds of failures, racist failures that we are capable of in, in this country. So we certainly need to learn from that, I guess. That's the point. Mm -hmm. uh, countries that think of themselves as monoethnic or just having one culture tend to disparage minority cultures often and sometimes discriminate against them. So the particular thing you're talking about, perhaps there in the book, is, a, is, is, is kind of about the experience of travellers who the state has provided money to provide accommodation for them for decades. Yeah. But local politics is such that local councillors who are leaning into anti-traveller prejudice in their communities have just not had the, the will to basically spend that money and provide that accommodation. So in other words, basically, the, the, the lurking racism or prejudice, you know, that, that exists in an Ireland against travellers or towards travellers has basically prevented local authorities from providing accommodation, even when money is provided. So it's not about just providing money to things. 
Like we put money into direct provision. It's it's about mentality. It's about it's about basically trying to. It's about winning the conversation, having the argument about what we should or should not be doing. So travellers basically, you know, were marginalised in many spheres of Irish social policy, even when that social policy was trying to be progressive. You know, twenty years ago, a little over twenty years ago, in Ennis and County Clare, where I come from, you know, traveller children were given different play times in the primary school to other children. That's segregation. You know, uh, now, so while some of these things have been stamped out, the, the lingering anti-traveller prejudice that is real, you know, is not being sufficiently addressed. And yes, now there are reports trying to put more pressure on local authorities to basically do better by travellers. But here's the point of it. Racism and prejudice is also part of the Irish story. There is racism in Ireland. Black people in Ireland experience racism. Travellers experience discrimination. Other groups experience racism and discrimination. And, and those, are, those are based on stereotypes people hold, fears people hold, and they need to be challenged and they need to be called out. And we need leadership. So it's not enough just to say, well, our politicians, we don't have far right parties doing well. We sort of do need to deal with the underlying racism that exists in some of our communities and also gets then reflected in some of our institutions. We need to challenge this. We need to challenge you know, how those organizations are doing their work, are failing to do their duty. Uh, and that's how we challenge it. I mean, that's why I actually raised this question. It's about yeah. accountability, because if we don't address, I, I know, you know, if we don't address one thing, that means we can't address other things as well, you know. So it's so what do we do in terms of accountability like that? Because that's the thing about racism in society, uh, to, to, to deal with racism in society, you first of all have to win the argument and, and get people to think that, well, OK, racism is a bad thing. So there are societies that have racism in them where people are prejudiced towards others, but don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. So, you know, we need to, you need leadership. You need basically leaders and mentors and others challenging racism. Uh, you, 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 you need perhaps basically education is very, very important in relation to this. But then so also is building empathy and community, uh, you know, in kind of, dealing with problems that exist in localities but but it often it comes down to basically good leadership and good example uh and basically trying to win that kind of endless conversation as human beings we always have about values uh where, you know winning the hearts and minds of others uh so that, that is that is something there's more work to be done around that certainly in ireland but as well as that we can then reflect we can change we can have things in the law that make it illegal for people to discriminate but those laws kind of exist anyway uh we, 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 we can basically, uh, again, a lot of this, I guess the reason I write my book and, and, and kind of you know, have on the cover of it, uh, and, 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 and I'm interested in focusing on the contributions these people make, is basically that we should be valuing the idea that we are a diverse community, that we identify with, with, with people who are perhaps of a different skin color as ours, or have Irish students also, as also Irish that we see ourselves as an us, and that we are more inclusive of those who are in our community. Uh, and it is a sort of a, a big, it's not just one conversation, it's many of these conversations happening at the same time. Yeah. But ultimately, it comes down to basically kind of convincing people that racism is a bad thing, and that we should be doing more about it, and that the kind of inequalities it, 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 it can generate is so, are so destructive to our society. They undermine so much. Uh, and I think we, you know, we, we, we've learned some of those things about, say, conflict in Northern Ireland, that you, know, you, you, you need to basically invest in community, you need to invest in inclusion, because if you let the worst prejudices dominate and you let people be discriminated against, that lights lies into the future. It, it sets up resentments. Uh, it leaves people feeling excluded and marginalised. Uh, so, you know, we look at the histories of other European countries around immigration and we see that immigrants have had to fight for equality, for inclusion, often for you know decades, and that the scars of discrimination, the scars of having a parent who basically went out to work and was discriminated against, that a child sees growing up, the mm. scars of experiencing racism in the playground on a child's hopes and aspirations for developing themselves in their life, that the that this destruction is is basically addressed, and we're better off without that, you know. So again, it is kind of complicated because human beings tend to be prejudiced. But at the same time, through leadership, uh, through basically emphasizing that which is positive, uh, through perhaps some also through using the law, yes, here and there, uh, you know, but having a vision as to what constitutes a good society 
that most of us can share and having the confidence that we can deliver this for ourselves, believing in a positive future, all these things are part of it. So it's in that spirit of hope, I guess, that I did the book as much as anything else. And I think oh, the hope is valid, even though the challenges are real. Yes. Yeah, I, I, you know, uh, I thank you for making the case for more citizenship, uh, you know, like more people taking up, you know, taking up the, the Irish citizen and contributing more in politics and all of that. And, you know, there's another place, there's so many places, I'm, I'm just cautious, I don't know how much time we have, of the, you know, about the children's citizenship uh, and all of that, the, the referendum and all, you know, that you mentioned in, in, in yeah, I mean, that is a, the referendum on citizenship was in 2004. Yes. In 2004, the Irish were people who were asked simply this question. Do you believe that the Irish-born children of immigrants are Irish? And 79.8% voted no. In other words, they voted to remove that birthright to citizenship. Now, that's sociologically quite a strong, kind of a complicated thing. But this is the sort of thing, this is one of the reasons I emphasize citizenship so much, is that people tend to feel natural empathy with people who share the same passport. Uh, one of the stories I think I have it in the book is, you know, uh, I think of Ibrahim Halawa, for example, a young man who was in prison in Egypt, but he was an Irish yes, man. Yes, yes. And once he's the Irish guy in prison, we want him back. We want him free. He's Irish. They've locked him up. They've locked up one of us. Citizenship is cognitive. It creates this kind of sense of inclusion. We imagine ourselves as sharing something profound with people who hold the same passport as ours are. That is, a, that is basically how the human mind tends to work. So the fact that we have citizens who are who are from from other cultural backgrounds, as far as I'm concerned, Brian Fanning speaking personally here, they are as Irish as I am, and that matters. So you know you can have an inclusive version of Irishness, or you can go down the the, the, the Donald Trump way and have a an America First version that seems very exclusionary, or like the right wing parties who claim to be nationalist, who claim to own the flag, they don't own that flag. As far as I'm concerned, they're they're abusing the flag. The flag belongs to all of us. The Republic belongs to all of us. And I'll be damned if basically a, a small bunch of right-wingers get to define who is and who is Irish. You know, this is something that we all contribute to. And we can have an inclusive and positive vision. And that's, that doesn't solve all problems, far from it. But it, it certainly helps us a lot here, and certainly on this island, have an inclusive idea of what it is to be Irish, to be a member of this society, to be part of this Republic. And it is a conversation we're, we should have because I think that, you know, in a certain kind of way, that conversation will reach people who, who don't necessarily think about immigration because they do think about being Irish. They do think of the Irish Republic. They, they value this. But allowing a small coterie of far right people to get to define who is Irish and who isn't strikes me as a, an absurdity in the 21st century. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. For, can I just urge everyone to get this book, Diverse Republic? Like, it's just yeah, such... Yeah, here's the thing. And it's, it's such an easy read as well. They will remember that book, but they will remember this. No, put that down. This is it. It's such an easy, easy read as well. Like, it's so easy to, to you know, get into it. And just so many, so many. It's just so much there's in it. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Thank you for this. Thank you. And I, I think we've, we've been on a long time now, and probably people at home even who will be watching this will probably want to go off and make themselves a cup of tea or coffee <laughs> or whatever is their poison. So uh, can I once again thank the sponsors of the Dublin Book Festival? Uh, can I thank the, 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 you know, kind of everybody who's been involved, the booksellers of Ireland, and also the great Irish public who read books. I mean, we're so lucky to live in a country where books are valued. Yes, um, so, a book festival is actually a cultural yeah. event. So, Milato, I hope we meet again in the flesh and in person soon enough. And oh, love that. And again, they will actually have human beings in the room, and that oh. will be wonderful as well. Thank uh, you so much, Brian. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me today, and thank you for sending me a copy of the Type yeah. Public. You know. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you, everybody. All the best now.